lighting a little bit. Anuradha ji. Hello, Dr. Richa. Hello. Yes, 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 Dr. Prakash. Yeah, are we uh, going to start with the Orion Alexi? Can I join after five minutes or something? There seems to be some problem with the connection also. I just I want to put the from the um, you know my cell phone kind of thing. I'll connect to this thing. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We are almost going live, Dr. Prakash. Yes. Yeah. You can you know, then then let's say uh, put me like uh, second or third or whatever in the record. Okay. I'll come back in sure. five minutes. Yeah. Sure. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Sure. 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 Please continue your discussion. Is it live, Ashish ji? Yes. 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 Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Richa Chopra from Sri Sri University. A warm welcome to the third and the final episode of the Mind Stage. Before we begin today's session, let me just set the context. Our understanding and experiences of the world is largely a subjective experience. And all this takes place in our heads. Whatever is enacted in our mind gets projected in the world outside. Who is writing the script of our minds? Who are the characters of the minds? Who are the heroes and who are the villains? What are the thoughts that our mind is engaged in? What is the understanding of the mind as a stage? Gurudev, Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji says, to keep up with the times, one needs to be creative, innovative, spontaneous, and enthusiastic. And to take care of the container, that is the mind, to take care of it, the way is yogic practices, meditation, and so many other, so many other traditions from the world that have given us tools and techniques to polish this container. Let me take the privilege to introduce Dr. Anuradha Chaudhary, who is an assistant professor from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kharagpur. And she also has done her PhD in Vedic psychology. So today evening, both Dr. Anuradha and myself shall be anchoring the show and let us see what our panelists have to say about mind, the importance of well-being of the mind, and what are the ways that the mind can be tapped to its utmost potentiality. So let me pass my baton to Dr. Anuradha Chaudhary. Namaste. Uh, Susayam, good evening and a very warm welcome to everybody on the show, to the panelists, to the students who are there and uh, the audience, of course. It's wonderful to have you plug in to join in this session and uh, look forward to a very engaging uh, program where you would have a lot of questions that our esteemed panelists, as well as the students who have gone through these programs, uh, can engage and answer those questions. So with these few words, I would also like to mention about the fact that in the Indian tradition, there has been a very old uh, approach, a very old science of understanding how the mind functions, because they gave it a very central role in uh, the human experience. And it is in this context that they had identified very early the fact that if one placed one's premium in investing in the quality of the mind, then that would ensure a good life for the individual and for the collective of which that individual was an important part. So in the Gita, for example, uh, Sri Krishna traces this wonderful 
order, the sequence where he talks about what is it that leads to a mind's destruction, but he gives it out in such a fantastic order. He says, Dhyayato vishayan punsaha sangas teshu pa jayate. So first the mind keeps contemplating on something and then it gets attached to that. Sangat sanjayate kamaha. From that attachment, there is desire that unfolds. Kamat krodho bi jayate. When we don't get what we want, then we get angry. Krodhat bhavati sammoha. When we get angry, then the mind is full of delusion. Sammohat smriti vibhramaha. From that delusion, there is a loss of memory of facts. Smriti bramsha buddhi nashaha. Once those facts are lost, the intelligence gets corrupted. Buddhi nashat pranashyati. Once the intelligence is corrupted, the individual is uh, on the path of self-destruction. And therefore, we see that there was a lot of premium placed on how is it, what are the stories that the mind is playing out? And in this context, we look forward to listening to what our esteemed panelists from various backgrounds have to share with us today. So it's my privilege to first introduce Sri Raghu Anantanaranji. Uh, Raghu Anantanaranji has a very interesting background where he is a BTEC and an MS from IIT Madras. And then he moved into a deep study of the yoga shastras and psychology. And uh, he has had the unique privilege of being a direct disciple of T. Krishnamacharya, who was one of the founding fathers of the modern movement of yoga. So with under a guru like that, we can only look forward to a lot of wealth that he has acquired in that company and that he can share with us. So he does a lot of programs with uh, organize, on organization development and leadership and focusing on the Mahabharata and of teaching people a way of working with Antaranga Yoga. He has an organization, uh, Ritambhara Ashrama in Kotagiri, where he organizes transformative workshops on uh, Mahabharata, the Yoga Sutras, on how we can live these in our lives today. So Raghuji, uh, it's been a pleasure to always interact with you and we're really looking forward to your sharings on the session. Um, next, I would like to introduce Professor Anju Davanji. Uh, Professor is uh, Professor Davan is uh, from the Department of Psychiatry and uh, the National Drug Dependence Treatment Center at Ames, Delhi, and she has had a very illustrious career and has been is part of several uh, a member of several international and national organizations. Uh, some of the international organizations is the International Society of Addiction Medicine Education and Training Committee. She's been a member of the WHO Expert Committee on Development of Treatment Guidelines for Management of Drug Use in Pregnant Women. Uh, Ma'am has had a very uh, big, uh, she has a very big list of publications. Uh, so Ma'am, it, it's a, going to be a great pleasure to have you on the session. Thank you very much for joining us and for enlightening us with the uh, role that mind plays on mental health. Next, it's a great privilege, of course, to introduce Professor Priyadarshi Patnaik. Uh, sir is the head of the Reiki Center at IIT Kharagpur and my boss also and a, and a mentor, a guide. He is the former head of the Humanities and Social Sciences Department at IIT Kharagpur. His research work has been uh, primarily on visual communication, Indian aesthetics, and lately he is looking into the role of relationships and the contribution to happiness, the role of generosity in happiness. Uh, sir also has a very varied background and uh, one of the most important things about Sir is that he himself is an artist, he's a poet, so he uh, brings these very special qualities into his teaching, into his research, into his guidance as the head of the center as well. And now trying to combine the science of happiness at the Reiki Center of Excellence for the Science of Happiness. So Sir, a uh, very warm and hearty welcome to you on this panel. Uh, Thank you, Anuradha. Next, I would like to introduce Professor Prakash uh, Padakanaya. Uh, Professor Prakash Padakanaya was trained in psycholinguistics and cognition during his PhD in Utkal University uh, in, and the MRC Cognitive Development Unit in London, UK. His PhD work was fascinating because he uh, was his work was one of the seminal works that showed the phonemic awareness, that, that phonemic awareness is not so crucial for learning to read Indian alpha syllabary. And since then, he's been engaged in his research, mainly related to the reading of dyslexia, language, cognition among children, adults, uh, literate and illiter illiterate populations. So very important field of uh, study and the contributions that he has made there. He's uh, also fellow, he's a fellow and a member of various international and national organizations. 
primarily the fellow of the Association of, for Psychological Sciences in the USA, National Academy of Psychology India, of which he was also being the president, uh, sir is the elected uh, executive council member of International Union of Psychological Sciences. Sir has been the recipient of various prestigious fellowships like the Japanese government fellowship, the Fulbright postdoctoral fellows, and several others. Each of the panelists are such illustrious personalities that trying to introduce them in a few words is doing injustice to their very vast contributions that they have made. But sir, with these few words, uh, I would like to welcome you very heartily again on this show. And we really look forward to your enlightened thoughts on this very important topic, and especially in today's context. So a uh, hearty welcome to you. And thank you. So Richa ji, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Anuradha, for the introductions of the panelists. And I would like to introduce uh, the alumni uh, uh, who have been a part of, uh, of, of a beautiful course called the Human Development and Counseling Vedic and Modern Perspectives, which had 19 perspectives to understand why we are the way we are. And this course started two years back in Shrishri University. And these students uh, have had no prior exposure to psychology, but from 19 trans disciplines, they got an opportunity over 140 hours over the weekends to understand uh, the human psyche. So may I take the opportunity to introduce uh, Grishma Ariel from Nepal. He has done his master's in journalism and mass communication from Shish University. And he has also been an alumnus of uh, the certificate course. He's based basically a designer, a singer, and a great animator. He's very good in animation, uh, basically a very creative person. Welcome Grishma to talk, to be a part of this uh, panel and uh, tell us your perspective about mind. Hmm? The second uh, alumni that we have is uh, Prabhu Prasanna Behra. He happens to be an advocate uh, with the Odisha High Court and also with the Supreme Court. And he also has uh, a great interest in serving the society by taking up cases for the underprivileged. And he was also an uh, alumni of this course uh, certificate course. Welcome, Prabhu, to this panel. And uh, yes, and then last but not the least, we have Vanita Shivastev. She did her master's in yogic sciences from Shrish University. And apart from uh, being uh, uh, a practitioner of yoga, she also has varied skills like being a Reiki practitioner, acu uh, pressure therapist and so on and so forth. So welcome Vanita to be a part of uh, this forum. So we are going to have a very interesting uh, deliberations with the experts and the alumni and the whole uh, ponderance today is going to be mind, its well-being and how to harness the mind to its optimal potential. And before we move forward, uh, we have a small uh, film, a very, very short film, very interesting, which talks about how the mind can be harnessed through so many cross disciplines. And Grishma, who is on the panel, he has been the one who, uh, who gave idea to this film and shape to this film. So I would request the IT team uh, to please display the film. And after that, we move forward. Ashishti, you can take, you can switch on the film. From the beginning.
Dr. Richa, you have to unmute yourself. My apologies. I just wanted to thank Grishma once again for that lovely film, and I hope uh, it was enjoyable for everyone to get this spirit. May I invite Professor Prakash Padakanaya to, to give his insights and viewpoints uh, on a very important question that all of us are eagerly waiting to hear as to what is mind? And the second part of the question is the role of mind in well being. Over to Professor Prakash Padakanaya from Ashoka University. Professor Prakash. Richa ji? Yes. Richa ji? Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Yes, Professor Prakash. Your views on what is mind and the role of mind in well being. Professor Prakash. I it seems that uh, there may be some connectivity issues. So until we have Professor Prakash back, uh, Dr. Anuradha, we can invite Professor Anjud Havanji, psychiatrist from All India Institute of Medical Sciences on the same topic. Dr. Anju, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yes, Dr. Anju. So, so, you know, as a psychiatrist, uh, I'll speak from the perspective of a psychiatrist. Our training is basically in diagnosing mental disorders, right? And mental disorders are uh, with a background from medicine. So men mental disorders are essentially diagnosed based on phenomenology. So we look at thoughts, we look at emotions, we look at behavior, and then we look at what is normal, what is abnormal. Where is the cutoff between normalcy and the beginning of a disorder, right? So that's the perspective psychiatry takes. So mind is a term that's not usually very often used in psychiatry, you know. And uh, if you uh, talk to people from medicine, uh, they are trained to look at neuroanatomical correlates, neurochemical correlates, neuroendocrinal correlates. So what is the structural aspect when you say mind, you know? So mind seems a term that is too, that is a little abstract from the perspective of a person with a medicine background, right? At the same time, when we talk of emotions, when we refer to mind in the general parlance, what are we referring to? We are referring to emotions. We are referring to the thoughts. We are referring to what determines behavior of an individual, which is happening inside. And there are neuroanatomical correlates which have been seen associated with emotions and thoughts, etc. Like the limbic system is associated with emotions. Now, as far as psychiatry is concerned, the uh, relationship between disorders, behavior, thoughts, emotions, and neuroanatomical correlates or chemical correlates is not a very clear, simple, uh, straightforward relationship. Because if it was that, then one would just, you know, uh, do some investigations and diagnose disorders. So mental health, if, uh, if so I'm speaking basically from that clinical perspective, but at the same time, when we look at a lot of people who may not be having disorders are looking for mental well-being. And that is where we refer to what is, you know, what determines a person to feel good about himself? What determines a person to feel uh, a sense of well-being? And I feel a whole lot of that information can be harnessed from the field of meditation, contemplative sciences. Because those perspectives, just the way psychology has looked at it from a Western persp perspective, contemplative sciences, the Vedic understanding looks at it from, a, uh, from the Eastern uh, perspective. So my interest as a practitioner of meditation, I felt that uh, a lot of stuff which I did not maybe learn as a clinician or as a 
uh, train well, during my training as a medical professional i got exposed to while learning techniques of meditation you know understanding one's own mind one's existence the subtleties of the mind thank you very much ma'am i mean in a very short while you helped us understand another very important dimension of the mind discourse where it is connected to a lot of the secretions of different elements different juices within the system and not as mind as per se which is an abstract con uh, you know construct so thank you very much for sharing that important insight i would next like to invite uh, shri raghunanth ramji to speak and to share his thoughts on uh, the topic of you know the role of mind and how it contributes to our mental well being thank you anuradha ji uh see my my interest in this whole area of studying the mind and so on started because i went through a lot of personal issues at one point of time just when i had finished college and i was extremely fortunate in that i met uh, uh, krishnamacharya and his son deshikachar just when i must have been going through my deepest dukha so the entire practice of yoga for me has been a practice of transformation and discovering well being from a place of a uh, pretty uh, huge shocks that life offered me as a gift yeah and one of the most fascinating things that i've discovered while working with the inner processes which is called antakarana or antaranga in uh, yoga is how important this whole aspect of yoga is in the entire process of transformation and i think it's important to point out that the yoga sutra which has got 192 sutras uh, has about 5 or 6 maybe maximum 8 sutras that talk about what is called the bahiranga the external aspects asana pranayama and so on and it's got about 70 to 80 sutras that talk only about the transformation of the mind and then the rest of the sutras talk about how this transformed mind can be applied to various things including science uh uh discovery of of how the planets are moving discovery of health several things like this it talks about so a whole chunk of the yoga sutra talks only about the transformation of the mind and how the transformation uh, also reflects in health uh, it reflects in one's own ability to understand the world and many aspects like this yeah the other extremely interesting uh, thing i discovered while i was studying yoga is uh, one of the oldest texts of yoga is actually the mahabharata and many ideas that were later talked about in the yoga sutra find a lot of mention in the mahabharata and what is fascinating about the mahabharata is that these truths are brought out through dialogue yeah i mean everybody knows about the dialogue between uh, bhagavan shri krishna and arjuna but that's not the only dialogue about yoga in in the mahabharata there are several dialogues and uh, many of these dialogues are actually juxtapositions of two kinds of minds so you have a mind like a duryodhana type of a mind which is just an aspect of us which can be you know caught with anger and envy and things like that and it faces a bhima kind of mind which is just as powerful they are equally powerful people but it tells you what a yogic process does so a person they're both equally bright equally powerful children but the practice of meditative processes the practice of reflective processes converts this mind into a bhima mind whereas the lack of reflectiveness the lack of contemplation creates a duryodhana mind and both are human possibilities so the mahabharata is a fascinating book it's a dramatic uh, exposition of yoga and 
it's just uh, something that everybody should get into and understand right not as a as a purana purana actually means what's happening to me right now it doesn't mean something that happened a long time ago so it really is a reflective book and an extremely simple way of understanding the self and the yoga sutra and the mahabharata are very close to each other so it's full of instances of what is a mind without well being what creates a mind without well being what is well being and what creates a mind of well being and it's just you know in other words how to contemplate is the fundamental thesis of the mahabharata very well spoken ragu ji and i'm sure it is very relatable very relatable mahabharat is an epic that most of us have have been exposed to acquainted and it's a very nice way to relate mahabharata with what happens to our mind with the characters wonderful uh, i would like to open the forum for one question uh, jyoti can you just take up one question and uh, we can see jyoti are you there yes ma'am yes one what question is the significance what is the significance of contemplation in the field of psychology in today's times what is the significance of contemplation in the field of psychology in today's time so any of the four panelists that can raise their hand we can take from any one of the four panelists whoever raises the hand first whoever would like to address this the role of contemplation okay uh, ragu ji okay if nobody is <laughs> yeah uh first of all i don't think there's any difference between modern times and old times and the relevance of psychology or whatever psychology is just a modern word and the old word that is there in india is antakarna sadhana or antaranga sadhana there are many words in ayurveda for example that talk about mental disturbances so it's not a new thing at all to start with right the other very critical a very simple way of understanding this is yeah if you want to cut a tree you have to polish and sharpen your knife right if you have to live in the world and if you have to look at the world and understand the world you have to sharpen your senses and make them as clean and as acute as you can contemplation simply makes your mind a very sharp instrument an instrument that's not disturbed by all kinds of emotional reactions to what you're watching so it's a absolute essential thing to be able to look at oneself and look at the world accurately and if i can't look at myself or i can't look at the world accurately i can't be a painter i can't be an artist i can't be an engineer i can't be a warrior nothing right it is simply the most fundamental uh, instrument of action and the entire indian thought is focused on how to make this a beautiful effective powerful instrument very well said ragu ji very very well said uh i would like to invite grishma an alumni to speak his thoughts in few words as to what he thinks is mind and what is the role of mind in well being krishna yes thank you richard ma'am uh, thank you for inviting me and you know to be very honest mind has always been a mystery to me and it it actually still is a mystery because you know we can't really point our finger at something and say that okay look this thing is called the mind so it it has always been a mystery which I, which is like worth exploring further and uh, but what i can uh, talk about is something that i have picked up upon 
while spending my two years in SSU from uh, mentors like you. And one clear distinction that I felt uh, like about the mind is was that uh, mind and brain are not the same thing. So uh, that is one distinction I was uh, able to understand because that is something that a lot of people confuse with that mind and brain are the same thing. But uh, what I have picked up from so many teachers at SSU and by studying you know, human development and counseling is that mind is much more than the brain. It transcends the brain because you know, our, our body, our, the mind is not inside the body, but it is the body which is inside the mind. And uh, the role of mind in well-being is also very important because uh, the quality of our life is actually dependent on, always dependent on the state of mind that we have. So it's not about what uh, the external facilities that we have, but uh, how our how uh, the quality, like how the state of mind we have at a particular moment, as at the present moment, actually determines the quality of our life as well. So <laughs> that is my answer in like short answer ma'am so thank you very much grishma for uh, bringing in this difference that a mind is not the brain and i think that is becomes a very fundamental uh, point to note and also experientially to understand that uh, difference between the two so thank you for pointing that out and being a student that you it has an it's an understanding that has grown upon you so that that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So I would next like to invite Professor Patnak. And uh, since Professor Patnak is heading the Reiki Center of Excellence for the Science of Happiness, uh, <laughs> he's also working on projects like the uh, MP project for the Happiness Index. So, sir, from your vast experience working with international and national teams, uh, what would you like to share with us on the role of mind and how it can contribute to our mental well-being? Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Uh, to begin with, uh, let me say that uh, when there are uh, fundamental questions, uh, apart from academics, uh, these questions uh, strike us as a, at a deeper level. And so um, I would be just uh, raising questions about the mind and then at the end, probably linking it to well-being very briefly. So the first question is that we are talking about mind, we are talking about manas, we are talking about various other terms. So is it that different people are calling different things by the same name? We don't really know. Because the, the moment we start exploring the different traditions and the different ways that things are defined, uh, certain fundamental issues emerge. And even if you're looking at our own tradition and looking at the uh, uh, Vedi, I mean, uh, the Vedantic and the Buddhist debate goes on endlessly. We will talk a little about that. The second question is that, is it the same thing and we are talking about it differently? So the feeling uh, that I have is that uh, the moment we start looking at it, for instance, somebody talks about the phenomenological aspect of things, somebody talks about the brain and mind connectivity or the dichotomy between the two and all those things emerge. The third question uh, which comes up probably is, is it an aggregate? Because this is something which Traditionally, we have been looking at that uh, whether we are looking at uh, the modern concept of split personality, whether we are talking about conflicting thoughts uh, like uh, Hamlet's to be or not to be, wherever we look, one of the fundamental issues which emerges is multiple voices, aggregates, composites, and um, within that, uh, a kind of a desire to hold things together by a cons consolidated concept of an I or one something. So an identity, uh, which we might call a uh, composite identity. I, I remember the uh, story, which uh, the anecdote in the questions of King Melinda, where you see that uh, the king asks Nagasena that uh, to define identity. And Nagasena points to his chariot and says that, what is the chariot? Is it the flag, which is the chariot? Is it the wheel that is the chariot? So. In the same way, when you are talking about the self, what is the self? So if another fundamental question, and this is a debate which uh, has not been resolved within my mind, and I, I will talk about that because there is an existential contextual relationship uh, related to that, is the other crisis is of self-referentiality because I am talking about mind, but I am talking as mind, 
So who is talking about whom? So the fundamental question of uh, the, the subject and the object, who is asking the question about whom? Or is that is that at some point of time, the, the quest, person who is questioning and the, the entire question itself dissolve into one? These, these are mystical experiences, fundamental uh, comments have been made uh, on this by various uh, saints and holy people, or I would say deep thinkers, but this is another fundamental aspect of things. If you're looking at the, the, the Vedantic tradition, if you're looking at the concept of a stable self, which is beyond all the fleeting uh, components that we have, this is one of the stands. And the other one is where we are talking about the no soul or the no self theory in the Buddhist tradition, especially from the early Buddhistic tradition. So that is the other stand. So some say that there is no self that is not denying the mind, but uh, denying uh, a fundamental, uh, I would say, ultimate identity. And the other one is uh, saying that this kind of an identity beyond everything exists. This is not only a metaphysical uh, problem, it is a problem of language itself. Uh, this problem adjacent, is it because of mind or is it because of language becomes another important question. So the other thing is that uh, all these things, I mean, I have been thinking about it today, and uh, these reflections bring all these variegated composites, very much like the metaphor of the mind, and uh, lead to another beautiful parable in the Buddhist tradition, which is the story of the arrow. So I believe that in one of the stories, the Buddha says, uh, somebody asks, what is the nature of uh, life? What is the nature of death? Uh, how many kingdom paradises and things are there and all that. And to this, the Buddha says that if uh, you are hit by an arrow, would you like to ask the question of what fiber the arrow is made, whether the feathers are red or blue, or would you like to take it out of your body? So in the same way, I probably feel that beyond these uh, debates that we are having about mind, there is one fundamental question that yes, uh, I believe that there are there are a few things uh, which make sense that I'm thinking, and or whatever that I is is thinking, or whatever this I or composite of I is is, is knowing, and that is intention. So because of these capabilities of whatever we call of call mind is exist, so the fundamental question is that one of the th realities that we experience in our daily lives is unhappiness or happiness, and we have a choice of going beyond our unhappiness? And is there a path for going beyond that happiness? To all these questions, probably the answer is yes. So that is the way I would very simply uh, link it to well-being because I wouldn't uh, venture into saying that I have knowledge beyond and uh, to say that, well, how can people be happy? I mean, there are experts in the field who would be able to tell that much better than me. But yes, they are very strongly linked in spite of these difficulties that we have. Thank you. So thank you very much for sharing these very pertinent reflections and most importantly for laying out the entire, for not the entire, but a wide spectrum of the critical questions that arise when we are contemplating on mind and what it is and the nature of the mind. And I think one idea that you have left us all with, uh, this is an excellent teaser for the course to start with, but I think an important thing you've left the audience with is the and the students, the prospective students, is the need to remove the arrow rather than talk about it. So I think that is a takeaway that our audience will have from what you've presented. With these few words, sir, thank you very much. And I'd like to invite our second alumni, Vanita Ji, to please share her thoughts on uh, the role of mind and uh, it, what it does for our mental well-being. Thank you so much for inviting me. See, I'll start with a simple version of yoga. Yoga, as we all know, is general terms as the union. It comes from the word yuj. So now here comes the word yuj and the union of what? It's, I'll explain with a simple example, the example of a river or a pond with the ocean. We've often heard that when it's so much hot, like the summit is going on, the river dries up or the pond dries up. But we have never heard any of such thing for an ocean. So that's exactly what it is about. The individual mind which we have and tuning it up, or you can say uniting it up with the cosmic mind we have. So for an example, suppose we are born of our 
parents, mother and a father. We get 23 chromosomes from the mother, we get 23 chromosomes from a father, and we come out with a very better form of species. That's what evolution is supposed to be. But still, we always have a scope of development, and so is the mind. It is in the perfect form, but it always has a scope of development. That is through contemplating, or through, it could be through meditation and many, many other forms which helps us to grow. So if you take it in terms of psychology and particularly contemplative sciences, it helps us to culture the mind. It helps us to make the mind strong. And it is not actually creating diversions. What it does is recreates. So what is important is that the mind that is happy and is contented, it produces health. That is a very important aspect in today's because health is a major issue. So even if you see all the scriptures, there are two main points which is mentioned, that mind is a friend and a mind is our enemy. Then we control it, it becomes our friend. But if we are controlled through it, it becomes our enemy. And through education, psychology, and the other contemplative sciences, what we are going to do is we are going to make it our friend and transcend above it and stay above it. So that's what mind is, and it makes us be healthy in today's world. That was wonderful to hear from a young mind, huh? Vanita, about the mind and the role of contemplation. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, very beautifully placed. I would like to invite Alkaji, again, a alumnus of the certificate course in Human Development Batch 2019, to ask a question from the public. Alkaji, can we have a question from you? Yeah, good evening, all. Uh, I want to ask that normally we see that whenever a new version of anything comes into existence, it is always an updated version of the earlier established one. So how would this program of psychology and contemplative studies going to be special and benefit the students in a unique way? Uh, Richard, your mic, please. I would request any of the panelists to please raise your hand and give your answer to the question that Alkaji has raised. Yes, any 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 panelist, if you can raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if you kindly permit me, then I will just uh, briefly respond to this question. Yes, Professor Patnaik. Yes. The, uh, the point I would like to make is that um, whenever we are looking at the Western tradition, uh, we find that a uh, lot of insights and a uh, lot of viewpoints very systematically are presented. And uh, we have it well, well documented and accepted uh, within the tradition and categorized in a specific way. When we are looking at the Indian tradition, we realize that uh, we have a very, very rich tradition and uh, we have a knowledge which is uh, categorized in a distinctively different way, which doesn't get acknowledged. One of the things I realized during these interactions and uh, which is badly required is that there is, a, uh, there is a tendency in the Western tradition to appropriate a lot of knowledge from various traditions and put it within their categories, which is perfectly fine, which is a very good thing they're doing. We also need within the Indian context to appropriate the various traditions, the various knowledges which exist outside and fit them into our framework. And then there needs to be an exchange of the two. Now I have a feeling that this particular course will uh, give an opportunity for this kind of a dialogue on equal terms to exist because there is always a hierarchy. A mindfulness is taken from the Buddhist tradition on created into, constructed into its own uh, brought into the uh, uh, tradition of uh, medic medicinal practices where they, for pain management, where there are no medicines available and all kinds of things are getting done. But within its framework, within its context, it has a very significant, uh, much deeper uh, role to play. And th that is something which is, which is something very often neglected. 
So probably this kind of a uh, combination would give an opportunity for understanding both the traditions within their context and for a, an exchange um, at a much more meaningful and deeper level. So that's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Sir. So I'll just take this opportunity to, in, opportunity to invite Professor Patakanaya because we've, we are lucky to have him on the panel at this moment. His connections have worked. So sir, could you kindly share your thoughts with us on the role of mind and uh, uh, its role in our mental well-being? So if you could kindly unmute. Yes, I have unmuted. And uh, could you uh, repeat, yeah, Naradaji? Like, because sorry, like I'm just, you know, like just so, join. So just your thoughts and based on your experience on the yeah. role of, on what the mind is and its role in ensuring our mental well-being. Oh, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, um, I got it. Uh, thank you, like say, I won't think like I, I, I'm sure, you know, like say, uh, there are, this is the third session and like say, a lot of, you know, like scholars have already talked about that. And also like, I don't claim, you know, like say myself uh, to be really, uh, I, you know, <laughs> big uh, man and like uh, respect to, you know, like these questions about, you know, uh, what has been talked about. Uh, but nevertheless, because who am I or like what is my mind, what is mind, if I know probably like I would have been like say, I mean, I would be very mad nani or you know, whatever you call. Uh, yeah, uh, but nevertheless, you know, like say, uh, I, I think like say, I'm sure in you know, like say others have touched upon like some more important things. But I would uh, briefly would like to say like only and maybe some two, three sentences, maybe. Um, let's see. You know, it's a mind body, uh, sorry, mind, what is mind? I think, let's like, say, there are, let's like, say, two uh, dimensions, you know, let's like, say, which, let's like, say, most of the, let's like, say, other scholars have talked about, you know, let's like, say, one, I would put it, you know, like, as I like say, what uh, uh, Chalmer uh, uh, said, you know, let's like, say, uh, big, big problem, bigger problem, rather, he calls it a, a big problem that is, you know, the mind body problem or like a mind matter problem, you know, let's like, say, which, which is actually, let's like, say, not, at, I mean, according, I mean, what I know a little bit about that, I feel, you know, like it is not really at resolved uh, kind of issue. But the second one, you know, like I think what like say, most of us uh, are, you know, like say are concerned about is actually the experience, you know, like say that is mind as we experience or, you know, like say subjective experience or consciousness or whatever you uh, one may call it. I think that is the one in like say, what most of us, you know, like say are, are at least in like a majority of the people, I think, let's say, are uh, you know, are addressing. Uh, though, let's say, many, uh, I, I think, some of the scholars have talked about the larger problem that's a, let's say, my mind matter problem. For me, let's say, I would take the only second position. That is, you know, let's say, probably like uh, uh, as we experience. Okay, where does it come from? This experience, or you know, let's say, what we feel, you know, let's say, thing. Where does it come from? Uh, like it is, you know, to uh, again uh, to cut it short because, like, I don't want to really, uh, you know, it's my fault. In like, uh, there's a problem at my end. Uh, so I, I would say that, you know, like, say, in a mind, probably can be seen as an emerging property of, you know, like, say, what goes on in, like, say, in brain and mainly the cerebral cortex. And what goes on, what determines there, you know, like what happens in, you know, like say brain probably depends on many other things like evolution or like, like because like it's a kind of mechanism what we have evolved to adapt, you know, like say to moment to moment kind of thing, what changes, you know, like in the environment, you know, maybe it could be challenges, it could be opportunities or, you know, whatever way, you know, like it, it uh, I mean, uh, the momentary, um, uh, changes, you know, like say that's a flexibility. I mean, it's a great, you know, like gift, you know, we have from our from nature and like, uh, you know, this brain. And then, you know, like say, mind is like say part of that. And there's nothing like in a mind and brain. I mean, so like say, you cannot separate, make them, you know, two halves and talk about mind and brain separately. They are together. And then, like say, wellness, obviously, yeah, sorry, I see another GC, another G, ki hat. No, I just wanted to add, if I can uh, just interrupt you or, uh, for yes, a moment, sure. just request you that if you can also make a connection between language and the mind, because that's a topic that you've really worked on a lot. So if you can just maybe oh. give two, three ideas on just that connection, just two, three sentences, uh, okay. bringing that perspective of the role of language, mind and mental well-being, because that would be special from you. 
mental well-being, let's say it's difficult to uh, connect, you know, let's say to the, to the first part, what you said. Anyway, but in like say language and mind, you know, let's say whether there are, like, there, are there has been those, you know, who are familiar with the language, uh, this field, they know that, I mean, maybe, you know, like familiar, but there are two, again, two views, you know, like say there is a um, hypothesis called Borfian hypothesis or linguistic relativity, which, you know, like says that there are two versions of that. Again, one is, you know, like the hard version which says that, you know, like say, the language determines the, you know, like say, thoughts, determines the mind. And the other one, you know, like say, you know, like it's not, you know, the hard, uh, you know, version, which is like say, which talks about linguistic relativity in the sense, like say, language does have an influence on the th thoughts, not, you know, like it determines. So like say, there is a lot, I mean, these, there are two groups of these, I mean, let's say, you know, scholars, but generally, like say, there has been more evidence for the second one and people, more of, most of the people would, you know, like talk about the linguistic relativity or, you know, like the, um, not the hard version, lighter version of what, I mean, other version of the uh, uh, hypothesis that, of course, the, I mean, language does play a role in, you know, like say, uh, in, uh, uh, in our thoughts and uh, but you know like there could be like say thoughts uh, without language that's why like and like goes against that but nevertheless language does play a major major role because you know um, um, you know you uh, for example uh, the uh, I'm, I'm just giving an example which comes to my mind immediately that like suppose you know, like if there are two like uh, two um, premiers or prime ministers of you know let's say or presidents of two different countries you know speak in their own language and what comes you know like is actually the translation like it's like actually translated but let's say that can you really translate you know like say everything like say what is there in one language into another language you know like there could be you know like i'm just you know highlighting the importance there could be really like say one word in like in language a made like maybe translated into a language b like in a different way which means you know, like which may not really convey the same thing so there could be which would lead to like say, a lot of misunderstanding actually basically Right. So, you know, like language is very important that I'm just, you know, wanted to say that. And then, of course, like say well-being, you know, like you wanted to convey, uh, connect uh, that to well-being. Well-being, what is well-being? I would like to say, like, say what is well-being? Well-being, you know, like say, like I, for me, it's like, now, how do you feel? actually? Now, how do you feel? Or like say, how do you feel? Where, where does it come from? Again, like it is a mind or, you know, like say thing. So it is actually like say, it's all, you know, like say mind which is, you know, like say, which is um, subjective experience, you know, like say, or, you know, like, which again, as I said, an emerging property of, you know, what goes on, you know, like say, you know, everywhere, and like it is embodied in, it is not only the brain, what, what happens in brain is like influenced by, like say, uh, you know, our, our, our other sensory systems, as well as, you know, probably the environment, context, everything, you know, like say, is in, it, like it influences that. Uh, so, but then out of that mind emerges, and so you know that's how like I see it. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I put it very briefly. I hope you know, it's clear. I can, I yeah, I would be glad to answer. You know, let's say I would uh, answer any questions later. Yeah, Doctor Prakash. Yeah. Thank you for the insights, and especially in the end to bring the connection between mind language. That was. Uh, Thank you. Yes, that is a very good connection. I'm, I'm glad that I could join you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. It had to happen. <laughs> yes. So uh, I would like to invite uh, the last uh, panelist uh, who also has been an alumni uh, with us on the Human Development and Counseling course, uh, Prabhu Kasanna Behra, to speak his thoughts about what he thinks is mind and the role of mind in well-being. And after this, we can go on to the next phase of the topic. We have 15 more minutes. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. I feel really honored to be a part of this discussion. I would start from uh, my friend's uh, Grishma's point of view that body can be inside the mind, but I would expand it that why, why body? The entire universe can also be uh, kept inside the mind. Mind has got that vastness. 
uh, and I would also add one more character of mind that is universality. It can be connected to anything and everything under the sun and maybe beyond that. Mind is such a factor which doesn't has the structural presence in our body, but it has got important functional presence in the body and outside the body also. I'll go beyond a little bit more towards well-being. So far as well-being is concerned, I will connect it to my profession as a lawyer. When I talk to, when lawyers talk to the clients and they understand the case, then present it before the judge, there they are not so affected. But with the same situation they face, then probably they are into a very disturbed situation. That is how the mind fluctuates from good to bad, positive to negative, past to pre present. So there, I, rem I was, I'm remembered of one shloka from Bhagavad Gita when uh, Arjuna asked that Stita Pragya Saka Bhasa, Bhagavan Sri Krishna says, Dukhesu Anubhigna Mana, Sukhesu Bhigata Spruha, Bita Raga Bhaya Krodha, Stita Di Muni Uchyate. I, what mm -hmm. I understand from my limited knowledge is when I detach my mind, my thoughts, and I become, I become a witness to my thought or I become witness to the mind, then probably that leads to a, a, a state of well-being. And coming a little bit more, to be more specific as a lawyer, that mind is also a property. It needs to be protected. And I, say, I must say that it is, it is a very important tangible property that is intellectual property. So we have various laws to that also. So my uh, entire uh, endeavor is to connect mind with Bhagavad Gita and as an intellectual property. So we have to see mind as a different person, as a witness, so that we will not get into it and we can protect our mind as an intellectual property. Thank you. This was most beautifully said, Prasanna, that uh, the mind needs to be protected. I truly believe that everything that happens outside is a manifestation of what is inside. And irrespective of anything, if this mind cannot be tapped, cannot be harnessed, cannot be cultivated, cannot be cultured, and in, in the vicissitudes of life, if this mind cannot be even, then the whole purpose of life perhaps is not so significant. Thank you so much for those beautiful insights. I would invite Jyoti once again to ask a question from the audience. This question is for the alumni of HDCVM. We want to know that what difference has HDCVM made to the lives of y'all who's done this course? Has it made a difference? And if yes, in what? Uh, HTCVM is the human development and counseling course that was all about understanding why we are the way we are from 19 transdisciplinary perspectives. So any one of the HTCVM students can answer that in a short, short manner. Yes, anybody who can raise your hand from the HTCVM alumnus. I think Grishma ji, if you could please speak, if you could share your thoughts. Yeah. Yes, sure. So uh, the importance of contemplation, like in my current profession, it has been like, it has been contributing a lot in my profession because, you know, even uh, I'm into this creative field, like I teach uh, visual communication. I, I mean, I'm into designing and animation. And I think uh, the role of contemplation uh, while generating ideas, when generating creative ideas is so important. And even when we, you know, look at, uh, when we read the biography of many like creative people, uh, I mean, some of the best works they have done, some of the best work, you know, the, some of the best artists have come up is when they were in contemplation rather than, you know, uh, while it's not while they were discussing or while they were in a meeting, so one of the best work they have come up with is when they were in silence and during contemplation. And I think that is very true. My profession as well. Uh, because whenever I have to be creative, I have to be like in a quiet area, like amongst easy manner. 
so i think uh, the uh, the contemplation aspect of you know human development and current work uh, as well so yeah i also saw the hand of prasanna if you would like to answer as to how understanding the human psyche from cross disciplines has helped you yeah yes uh after going through the wonderful syllabus i feel i I'll, i'll make it in a very simple word that it's a bouquet of knowledge that we have always understood a particular syllabus from one perspective let let it be mathematics physics or arts any subject but this course is a amalgamation of various uh, streams of knowledge probably which anyone could have thought in its lifetime for example astrological aspect for example uh psychological aspect for example uh sociological aspect so and uh, and many more things so once we understand from various angle it has given a, a holistic view about life suppose personally i would say that when i see somebody is getting angry i respond to that as it looks to to me but when after the, doing the course uh under the guidance and able leadership of richa didi so we could understand that this is probably not the what what is seen to us it's something else and it is probably might be some chemical uh, problem with the mind or the or some mental problem or or anything probably with the uh, astrological aspect with the uh, sun sun stars anything and we have studied in detail so i would not respond to uh, the anger so that it will bring a holistic uh, Uh, approach to the situation and it will definitely reach in a well being of myself and of course with the other person too so it has got a wonderful result in my life and it is seen for the society also thank you one of my friends who is basically a mathematician and an it software engineer he has also done a lot of work in sanskrit and he was sharing one day in his philosophical mood that see the chair when god made the universe and all the laws that the universe has the universe doesn't decide to function in a particular manner because this law belongs to physics or chemistry or maths or philosophy the way the whole universe operates it borrows whatever law it has from whichever discipline and that is how the universe operates so why do human beings or uh, people who are working in specific streams have to restrict knowledge only in that stream why cannot there be a cross disciplinary understanding of something which is so subjective which is the human mind where the universe doesn't do that and it borrows all principles and laws from all disciplines we should also have the open mindedness to be able to see things from all cross disciplines and i really like this view so much it really touched me so i just wanted to take it from prabhu and uh we have another 10 more minutes or so for the uh, for the episode 2 and and i would like to invite one thought from all the panelists now uh, as to how to see the amalgamation of psychology modern psychology with contemplation uh, in contemplation Uh, we have not restricted ourselves only to contemplation from one particular tradition we have tried to take contemplation which is embedded in global traditions whether it is religion whether it is philosophy whether it is an art form and whatever connects oneself with oneself and takes oneself to one source is what we have taken and amalgamated it with modern psychology and uh, we are going to start our programs this academic year where its students will get the best of east and west to human sciences so i would like to invite the thoughts of our panelists on this amalgamated um, endeavor that we have taken and our panelists also happen to be on the advisory of the department so it would be nice to hear their perspectives Uh, from the same we can start with any one of the panelists and we'll have about one minute each uh, to take yes doctor to i can see your hand yes so uh, you know already it's happening in the sense that if you see psychotherapy the third wave of psychotherapy is all about uh, 
introducing the techniques of meditation and mindfulness in practice of psychological interventions. So in the last 10 years, it has gained much more acceptance in the field of psych psychotherapy and psychological interventions because of the simple understanding that uh, uh, the way the Eastern philosophy looks at thoughts and the way meditation processes look at thoughts, thoughts automatically get altered on observing, which is a simple phenomena, while the cognitive behavior therapy was looking at modifying the thoughts. So I think that's a very exciting beginning, but there is a whole lot of other aspects which the Eastern philosophy has to offer, which can easily get integrated into mainstream psychiatry and psychology uh, over time. And I think uh, this department and the initiative is a very wonderful uh, initiative in that direction. Dr. Patnaik, your thoughts on the amalgamation of psychology with contemplation. Um, thank you, Richard Ji. Uh, there are two observations I would like to make, uh, uh, or rather three. The first one is that uh, if you want to get a uh, totality of uh, understanding about something uh, uh, to get a complete picture which is required, uh, you need to look at different traditions. So that, that is very true. Uh, but the two observations that I have to make is that, the, and I know that uh, the entire team has worked very hard on it, uh, which is to have a delicate balance because the moment you start looking at varied traditions, the amount of knowledge available becomes so fast that it can become unveiled. So I know that uh, the people who have developed this course have worked very hard to take care of it. But this is, this is a word of caution that we need to have within our minds that uh, we take it carefully forward, otherwise we'll be lost uh, because the, the area is very vast. The second observation relates to the fact that uh, I would quickly refer to uh, one of the projects, uh, MHRD projects, which many of the IITs uh, were working on, which is one uh, Sandhi, Science and Heritage Initiative, uh, where one of the fundamental things that uh, we have in our tradition is wisdom, but one of the fundamental things we lack in our tradition is a mechanism or a methodology, a documentation of the methodology by which we arrived at the wisdom, which the Western tradition has. And this was very nicely put by our former director, Professor P.P. Chakravarti, that our sages gave us wisdom, but the pathway through which they empirically validated it is something which is lost. So one of the purposes of Sandhi was to ensure that uh, we could recreate or we could revisit those pathways and kind of validate it scientifically. I believe that one of the contributions that this course can make is to uh, prepare people and as well as the faculty who are working on it so that this scientific validation, which is unfortunately very much required if we want to establish ourselves outside is something which is also taken care of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patnak. I'd now like to invite uh, Raghuji to kindly share his thoughts on this. Raghuji, please unmute. Uh, so when I've been working with uh, Richaji and her team and looking at the whole process, um, what I kept getting reminded of was a very important statement from Sankhya, which actually talks about how to end Dukkha. And it says, Vyakta Avyakta Nya Vijnanam. And what's very interesting here is it talks about understanding the world of the tangible in depth. It talks about understanding the intangibles that produce the tangible. And most importantly, it talks about the mind that is viewing both of these. So I don't understand actually how any person in any science can operate with integrity without understanding this fundamental, that understanding the vyakta and analyzing it does not give you wisdom. It doesn't end sorrow. Just understanding some processes below it also doesn't uh, end sorrow, which means human sorrow, not just personal sorrow. And unless you really understand the seer and what's happening at that level, at a very deep subjective level, I don't think Dukkha can be ended. And in our tradition, uh, whether it's poetry or whatever it is that you take, 
if you're not enabling the person to go one step towards truth and one step away from dukkha uh, it is not recommended that it is done at all it is an adharmic act so use of knowledge uh, deploying knowledge without really contemplating on where i'm coming from and who am i is uh, uh, adharmic fundamentally so it's a very very important thing that you're doing rachaji hopefully the world will turn more towards dharma because of what you're doing thank you raghu ji that's a blessing i would say hmm? from everybody i would like to invite vanita to speak her views on psychology and contemplation in very few words your mic vanita thank you ma'am ma'am to me psychology is like it's it the intensity of whatever happens to us is in inverse proportion it's in an inverse uh, ratio you can say to the strength of the mind the more strong and more healthy your mind is the less you are affected from the things around you and that happens only when there's a proper education and you get to have the perspectives in all the field so once you have the perspective you stop being judgmental you stop looking on a very constricted platform you just bask in it and you know what others also feel when you know yourself until and unless you know yourself you don't you can't even think of knowing someone else so that is what psychology helps us in and contemplation definitely helps us move along that thank you anita that's very encouraging and uh, dr prakash you have been guiding the department with all your thoughts especially from the stream of modern psychology i am really grateful well, to uh, richard ji yeah yeah thank you oh, yes i mean i'm yeah yeah thanks yeah i mean uh, the the very idea or the department you know like say definitely is a very unique and very colorful as uh, you can see you know from the variety of you know like say statements opinions you know like say all the scholars are given so far so i would not like to re- i mean repeat that uh, so rather you know like say i would say i mean like in a different way um, i mean it is unique because there is definitely there's no such you know like uh, there's no other you know uh, such a department in like in the country uh, you know focusing on these things definitely it is unique and as i said in like say colorful because in you know, a variety of ideas really seem to be coming in and uh, but for me like i'll put it in like in slightly different way for me it's like you know it's it's more like a cognitive science for me it's more like a cognitive science because uh you know you know you know that cognitive science studies and the focus of you know cognitive science is mind studying the mind and uh, it it like it is an interdisciplinary uh you know um discipline you know like which uses you know like in fact philosophy uh, psychology linguistics um, um and then computer science and then neuroscience you know like are integral parts of you know like say cognitive science and these are these are also uh, i mean these are also the building blocks of you know like say i would say dcbs the way because i'm involved there all these are you know like there like it's all integral parts of you know what you want to do there so i do hope that you know like the department will really evolve into a top class you know like say uh, kind of center or department for pursuing scientific study of you know like the mind and the students you know like say, who come here also like say really get well trained and then go out as good you know like human beings as well as you know like say, practical i mean you know the real uh, to fit to uh, um, you know live meaningfully and uh, in the realistic world that's all and that's my wish thank you thank you dr prakash yes go back as good human beings i would go a step uh, further as even human beings who can handle their mind one person able to handle one's own mind positively creates the ripple effect in the society and okay. emotional pollution is something which is really high really high and that is only because most of us do not know how to manage our minds positively um one more thing i would like to say as we conclude the session um 
today is that yes, anyone who has no background in psychology can also come and pursue a master's or a bachelor in psychology and contemplative studies. Uh, may I invite Wiplef who has just joined? He has been a part of the last two mind stages. Uh, Wiplef, maybe you can conclude the session. Wiplef, are you there? Yes, he has been no, the anchor for the last two sessions. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jagar Dehwal, good evening. Uh, uh, for me, it has been a very wonderful journey right from uh, the day I had a discussion with Richa Didi about uh, she's up thinking of a course which will have several dimensions about human life and, and I, I, I was I was just looking for something which you, which could lead me to uh, what makes me think what I think uh, what makes me uh, be uh, what I am and and the the moment she said me that this is uh, something which we are coming up with, I said, Didi, you course kabhi bana hai, nahi bana hai. Mera naam pehle lik I am the first. <laughs> I, I just want to be a part of it. And, and uh, human development and counseling has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, like how I am seeing uh, this department is... Uh, beyond uh, beyond my existence i would say <laughs> this 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 is uh, wonderful and just just uh, one uh, thing which i would like to add is uh, all the panelists have already said this there would be a cutting edge of being human in this uh, artificially intelligent world uh, the human factor which would be uh, added uh, through this department and the whole habitat of DCBS. So uh, I really, really thank <laughs> Richard Didi to make me a part of it. I don't like how I would ever be a part of it. It's only because of her. It's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience. And thank you all, all the experts who have been continuously uh, guiding all of us uh, to this uh, course, this beautiful department. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Anuradha, you can take the baton and speak your last word. <laughs> so I would just like to first and foremost <clears throat> thank, thank all the panelists, all the experts and the alumni for having shared very important insights, uh, which add different perspectives to this very multifaceted dimension of the mind and the important role that it plays in our well-being. So a uh, heartfelt gratitude, sense of gratitude to each one of you for having been here and shared your thoughts with the uh, audience that is there. And uh, just to close, I was just thinking that this, uh, I mean, just like what Vipluff said, being part of this designing of this course, not just him, but even people like us who've had a certain background in the study of psychology were tempted to sign up for this. So I think there is an invitation, a, a temptation to uh, try and get the best of the East and West in the domain of mind studies that will be offered through the courses in this department. So if you have the energy, you have the interest, you have the time, uh, do consider uh, this investment is not just another degree that one would get, but I think it is really an investment in the whole phenomenon of being, uh, of discovering oneself. And uh, that has long-term benefits for everybody concerned. So I think with these words, uh, I was also telling Richard Ji, the last thing is that this is the only department where Sanskrit is going to be taught as a language of contemplation. So <laughs> that is also going to be an interesting experiment to see here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richaji, for making us part of this. Thank you to the Shishi University for thinking of this wonderful project. And uh, looking forward to as many of you signing up and making a success of this human venture. Thank you, everybody, for being a part and being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Thank you for all the directions and guidances. And it's a huge responsibility on my shoulder. <laughs> and I'm sure that together we'll all forge ahead because we really mean good, all of us. Thank you so much. <laughs>